Make sure you check out our online store where we work with our graphic designer to create stunning garment and product designs that feature a wide variety of aircraft types such as British fighters, World War II aircraft, American bombers, Russian fighters and much more. You can pick your favourite designs and personalise any items within our Redbubble store that range from clothing right the way through to stationery. All of our designs feature our logo so you can show your support for the channel while getting a quality product. You can head to our website aircrewinterview.tv and click store or go to redbubble.com forward slash people forward slash AC interview. Thank you and enjoy. Trevor, when did you first become interested in aviation? Um, <clears throat> so I always grew up loving uh, flying. Uh, I never really had the opportunity to do much flying growing up. I uh, just didn't grow up with uh, a lot of means and uh, didn't have anybody really in the community that, that could kind of show me the way. But um, I, you know, I grew up, so I grew up in a, a little town in Texas called Wichita Falls, uh, and they're home of a pilot training base there um, called Shepard Air Force Base. And so I would always watch the T-38s fly over. Uh, and I don't know, I just always, I always looked at that as something that was really, really awesome. Something that I really wanted to do. Um, I've always loved mechanics, right? Like how, uh, how cars work, how machines work, right? Planes, trains, automobiles, those types of things. Uh, and so it's just always been kind of, uh, seeing the flying seem to always be that, like, uh, the coolest, uh, version of that. Absolutely. So what year did you actually join the U S air force? Uh, so I started, so I actually signed with the air force right out of uh, high school, uh, and they helped pay for my college. So, uh, I went to university, uh, and they paid for, they paid for my university and, and a little bit more beyond that. So that was in 2004. Uh, and then in 2009 is when I graduated from university. And, uh, from there, uh, is when I actually commissioned as an officer. Uh, so 2009 is when I, when I officially became an officer in the air force. Awesome. So let's talk about some of the aircraft you started training on when yeah, before you became like, you know, the, the fighter pilot that you are today. Uh, so when I was in a, when I was training in college, uh, going through that, uh, what we call reserve officer training corps, uh, I had the chance to fly the T-37, uh, the tweet, which uh, uh, yeah. for those, you know, big, big Hershey bar, non-pressurized. Uh, it was the pr you know, primary training for, for the Air Force for a very, very long time. Uh, so I had the chance to fly that just kind of as a as a student, uh, as a as a cadet, uh, and that was uh, that was an interesting experience. Um, but once I actually started pilot training, the Air Force had transitioned over to the T6 Texan II. So uh, it's a, a Beechcraft, uh, you know, thousand horsepower turboprop, uh, really really fun airplane. Um, so that's the first airplane that you fly in um, in actual pilot training. Before you start that, you they uh, send you out to. Uh, Colorado for a little bit if you don't have a lot of flying experience to fly on a what's called a diamond DA-20 uh, and you get about 18 you know just very basic hours on that about 18 hours or so uh, to get just your basic airmanship under you and then from there you jump to the uh, from you know your your tiny little lawnmower engine airplane to a you know thousand horsepower T6 uh, fully aerobatic airplane and um, it's it was awesome it was really cool it's a uh, it's a very fast pace so um Coming from somebody who had no aviation background, uh, I was, uh, you know, they, they throw you in and you're soloing after, you know, you know, less than 10 hours, you're, uh, you're going out and you're doing aerobatics, you're doing, uh, instruments, you're doing, uh, low level navigation. I mean, you, you handle a lot of different stuff all within about a six month period. Uh, and, uh, and it's, it's pretty cool from, uh, from there you transition on and, uh, in the air force, we have uh, the air force pilot training is kind of starting to change right now, but, um, the way that it, it currently still is, uh, and the way that when I went through it was that, uh, after the T6, you will kind of track select from there. So if you want to go fly helicopters, you do that. If you are, are pursuing more heavy aircraft, you'll go fly the T1. Uh, if you are going more, want to go more of a fighter bomber track, then you go to the T38. And that's the route that I took was the T38. So, um, so I went and flew the T38, uh, got about a hundred hours in that as well, uh, prior to, um, you know, getting my wings as a pilot. Awesome. So how long did you spend, uh, training before you got posted to your first frontline aircraft? Yeah. So, uh, the, the training, once you start pilot training to the time that you are, uh, done with pilot training is about a year. Uh, it's about a year long process. Um, once you're done with that, then towards the end of that process, they will select what, what aircraft you're going to go fly. And, uh, it's, it's pretty much purely, um, a rack and stack based off your performance, uh, where they have a list of what's available, the top 
guy on the list kind of gets to make his list and they match it up the best they can and then they work their way down. Um, so I was fortunate enough out of pilot training to get my first uh, choice, which was the F-15C. Um, I had, uh, I was, uh, I'm, I'm a born and raised Texan, uh, for, uh, so, uh, we, I, you know, born, born in Texas, went to, went to a university in Texas. I went to pilot training in Texas back in, back in my hometown. Uh, and so I wanted to go, I wanted to be, join the air force to go see the world. And, uh, I spent a lot of time uh, in Texas, which I love, but I wanted to see a little bit more. And, uh, at the time, uh, and still currently, the only active duty F-15C bases are in either uh, England uh, at Lake and Heath, RAF Lake and Heath, or uh, over in Japan, uh, so uh, over at Kadena Air Base, Japan. And so I knew that by choosing that airplane, uh, I would get to get to go get away for a little bit and go travel. And uh, and so I was fortunate enough to get selected to go fly that airplane. Um, but you don't go straight to that airplane. So what happens is all fighter pilots, at least the way that the, the structure works now is uh, once you get done with pilot training, then you get sent to uh, what's called introduction of fighter fundamentals. Uh, and it's a really interesting, yeah, really interesting little nine, nine week course where you still fly the T-38, but you learn the, the basics of being a fighter pilot. So you learn uh, dog fighting or what we call basic fighter maneuvers. You learn um, how to drop bombs, BSA, uh, SAT, uh, close air support, CAS, um, and, uh, and so, you know, air, air combat maneuvering. So two V one engagements and, and they're starting to offload even more things into that program. Uh, but it's a really, really great program to learn a lot in a very little bit of time in an airplane you already know before going on into the, uh, the advanced fighters. So that program was about nine weeks. And then, uh, and then from there I went to Oregon to go fly, learn how to fly the F-15C. So what were your first thoughts when you got posted to the F-15C? You must've thought like, get in. That's amazing. I honestly, I was, I remember just being so overwhelmed. I remember uh, a buddy of mine that uh, we had got kind of gone through some of the training together and we were starting the, the Eagle training together. Uh, and we kind of looked at each other. And we we're like, are they really going to let us fly this thing? <laughs> like, we're just like two dumb kids. Like, how are they going to let us fly this like giant beast? Cause it's a big airplane. Yeah, it like is, the yeah. Eagle is a, I mean, for those of y'all who have seen it up close, it is a massive airplane. Uh, and so the concept of jumping in single seat and and navigating, I mean, it was thrilling. It was exciting. But I was like, man, somebody's making a bad mistake <laughs> letting us go and jump in. The paperwork's gone wrong here but, somewhere. <laughs> yeah, something's wrong. But I'm not gonna I'm not gonna correct it for them. So yeah. Um, no, it was uh, it was it was incredible. Um, I mean, it, you know, every airplane that, that you train on, you get a little bit more power and a little bit more power. And certainly once you get to the F-15C, um, you know, we were flying uh, and I was flying in the wintertime. Uh, in in Oregon, and so it was that cold air uh, getting pushed through, and just tons of thrust. Uh, it was it was uh, it was pretty awesome. awesome. Yeah. So talk us through your ground training. Um, was it quite demanding going on to like such a, like a, a fighter like the F fifteen C? Yeah. So the military, I think, does a really really good job with teaching you how to learn. Uh, that's one thing that even through university, you can kind of learn on your own pace or you're not really pressed for time. But uh, going through pilot training, uh, you know, I was part of uh, uh, when I went through pilot training, it was part of uh, NJEP. So you're a NATO joint jet pilot training, uh, which is uh, it's really interesting because we um, we've got a lot of NATO countries that train together. So uh, mm -hmm. you could have a Dutch IP or a German instructor or in my class I had Italians. And right. I mean, you have, uh, you know, a lot of different countries. Uh, England's actually a part of it. Uh, they do most of their training still in the UK, though. Um, so, but the point is that it is a very fast paced, uh, the, you know, there's so much information coming at you that there's no way that you can internalize all of it the way that you could in university. Uh, so you have to learn how to prioritize the important information, uh, so that you can perform well. And, uh, so that starts at the beginning of pilot training. So, uh, we call it the fire hose effect. Right. So you're it's like it's like opening up a fire hose and trying to drink from it. Like you try to just get as much as you can, but like you're not going to get it all right. So uh, so that it really starts at the beginning of pilot training. Uh, and I would say that that learning curve continues to increase as far as the challenge and difficulty of it. So by the time you're getting to uh, the F-15, you know, you're spending very little time learning how to fly the airplane. And and most of what you're learning is the tactics. Right. Uh, you're jumping, you know, every every step of training, you're jumping into a whole new world that has a whole new language uh, that you don't understand. And you're trying to just figure out what's going on. And so uh, so by the time that I get to the B course, it's, uh, you know, by, by the time fighter pilots get to the B course, it's more um, they understand how to learn. Uh, now it's just applying that to a completely different system, which is how to tactically employ an aircraft. Um, mm -hmm. But the what I would say is the training that leads up to that is what gets you ready for that. 
Right. And we're going to have to talk about this, Trevor. Uh, your first flight in the F-15C, and did you manage to get a, uh, a Zoom climb in your first flight? And if you didn't, tell us about that. Yeah, so the uh, <clears throat> so the, the basic course for the F-15C is in uh, Oregon now. It used to be in Tyndall. It's, it's in Oregon now, in Klamath Falls, Oregon, at uh, Kingsley Field. And uh, they they understand how exciting it is for people to have their first flight. And so they're actually really good. The city of Klamath Falls is really, really supportive of the military. So um, they don't, they're not upset about noise violations. They, they love the sound. So, uh, so we get unrestricted climbs pretty frequently. And, and yes, on my very first flight in the F 15 C uh, it was actually a 15 D because it was a backseat model because uh, it was the first flight, but, um, but yeah, we got to do the unrestricted climb. And uh, so yeah, sitting at the end of the runway, you throw the throttles to max AB the acceleration is quicker than anything, obviously, I'd, I'd, I'd ever flown before. Um, so you run the risk of, you know, getting your gear up in time, overspeeding your gear because you're accelerating really, really fast. Um, you know, I wasn't worried about keeping it low because it was my first one ever. I just wanted to make sure I, you know, got the gear up and it overspeed it, you know. And, yeah. and that's the thing is what, as you're doing these things, you, you're so – uh, focused on not screwing something up that sometimes it can be tough to like truly sit back and appreciate everything going on. But, you know, I tried my best. And, uh, and so, uh, so cleaned up the gear, uh, kept it low, you know, I blow a couple hundred feet and, uh, in the really, uh, you know, backseat is like, all right, go up and you just go up and you go up to 90 degrees and, uh, you're just continuing to accelerate and uh, it's, it is wow. pretty incredible. So, um, you know, obviously I've had the chance to do that quite a few more times since then, uh, in a various sort of different aircraft, but, um, but yeah, that first time is pretty special. So yeah, it doesn't. What kind of training sorties would you be conducting uh, going through as a student? So the F-15C, obviously, I, you know, I, th I think most of your uh, listeners are aware that you know it's a air superiority aircraft. So um, you know when they when they made the airplane, they said not a pound for air to ground. Yeah. Uh, it was. Uh, it is purely designed for one one purpose and one purpose only, and that's that's air superiority. So. Um, so it's, it was really nice. I really enjoyed the ability to really hyper focus on that specific mission set. Uh, but the way that, uh, the training works is that they will, it's a building block approach, just like anything else. So, uh, when you first start the, the first, you gotta learn to fly the airplane. And so it's just, all right, let's fly around a couple sorties. Let's do some aircraft handling. Uh, let's do, uh, some instruments. Let's make sure that we can, you know, do all that stuff. Uh, after only a couple, you know, one or two sorties where they can check to make sure that you're good to go, you get your instrument check fairly quickly. And then now the rest of your sorties for the most part are uh, single seat, right? Um, I think the first time that you go to the tanker, there's somebody in your back seat, right? The first time that you right. do kind of some new things, uh, they'll throw people in your back seat, but otherwise, uh, you're, you're pretty much single seat from then on. Cause they, that's what they want you. They want you to, to make sure that you're, uh, you're thinking in that mindset because it's a very different mindset. Uh, and so, so once you've got the basic aircraft control done, now you, it's a building block approach. So you start off with your one V one engagements, right? So you start off with BFM basic fighter maneuvers. Uh, you will learn offensive where you're starting off and, and you you've got the bad guy in front of you. Uh, you'll move on to defensive where he's behind you and you're trying not to die. Uh, the tough one about that is not going through the floor, right? So when somebody's, you know, trying, uh, trying to attack you and you're, you're, you know, jinking and jiving and trying to survive and, uh, it can be tough to see a floor, the floor coming up, particularly when it's an artificial floor, right? We establish a, a higher floor, uh, obvious for obvious reasons. So, uh, so yeah, you'll look down, you'll be like, dang it, like, <laughs> I'm, you know, 300 feet below the floor or whatever the case may be, uh, yeah. cause you're descending pretty quick in a lot of those fights. Uh, so then after defensive BFM, you'll move on to high aspect BFM. So that's where you're, you're approaching beak to beak, uh, from high aspect BFM, you'll move to air combat maneuvering. So you'll, uh, you'll move to, that's a two V one. So, uh, say that, uh, you know, you and your flight lead get somebody roll up on, on your six. How do you handle that situation? Um, and then once you get from ACM, now you start moving into kind of the more beyond visual range type fights. So you, your basic one V one intercepts. You go uh, 1v2, 2v2, uh, you work your way up to 4v4, 4v6, 4v8 uh, engagements. Uh, and then if, uh, depending upon the capability as far as uh, integration with others, now you'll start working into more larger exercises. So uh, you'll you'll be integrating with strike eagles or 22s or F-16s or, or whatever to, to focus on more of a larger scale war and fight adversaries that aren't just uh, eagles. Um, and once you get that and you have those, that basics down, then, uh, then you're really ready to send you off to the calf. Jesus. That's a, that's a, a lot to take in, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's uh it's a lot of information, but it's a hell of a lot of fun.
Absolutely. So how, I mean, what was the F-15 like to handle and did she have any strengths and weaknesses? Yeah. Um, so the, honestly, I love that airplane. I think of all the airplanes I've ever flown, that's, that's my favorite one. Um, and the reason why I like it is the same reason why I like the types of cars that I do. Um, the F-15 is, is a, right. The cars I drive, I like to drive manual transmission. Uh, you know, I prefer not, I don't like the extra bells and whistles of things of, of the computers trying to help me out. Uh, I like just kind of being directly connected to the machine. Uh, and that's what it's like to fly the F-15. So, um, it's a pure, it's a hydromechanical, uh, system. So there's a stick in the middle and when you move the stick, it moves a flight control and, uh, that gives you what it's going to give you. Um, and so there's, there's pros and cons to that, right? So, uh, the advantage is that you can take the aircraft to its limit, to its actual like aerodynamic limit. Uh, the problem is, is that you can take it past its aerodynamic limit, oh. right? Uh, and the problem is, is that y you can't get good about, taking it to its limit unless you are constantly finding where that line is and taking a slight step back from that. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's particularly referencing like your AOA limit uh, on the aircraft. Right. Um, but there's things that you can do with the Eagle that you just can't do with other aircraft. Right. So there's uh, the ability, the use that you get with the rudders. Right. It's got two giant rudders that are sticking out the back of the airplane. And, and when you're under a high AOA situation, the ailerons are washed out. So you can use your rudders to high, to, uh, you know, success, uh, for maneuver maneuvering, if you know what you're doing, uh, what that winds up leading to is it winds up leading to a B courser. So, uh, the gap of experience or the gap of, uh, skill, I guess, uh, from an Eagle pilot that has just gotten out of the B course or someone who has a thousand hours in the aircraft, uh, is pretty dramatic because the B courser still doesn't really, the one who just yeah. got out of the basic course doesn't really know, like he knows how to fly the aircraft, but he, but his ability to take that aircraft to its extreme limit, um, is not as good as somebody who has a lot of hours and a lot of experience in it. Cool. Uh, and so it's, it's kind of like the old school days where, you know, you could tell, uh, the experience meant an incredible amount as far as, uh, their ability in the kind of one V one engagements, um, as opposed to other aircraft, like, you know, my experience in the F 16, it's a phenomenal airplane. Uh, but you, this, you, you pull on the stick and the stick sends a signal to the computer. The computer is going to tell, uh, the flight controls what to do within its own safety, uh, parameters. Um, and that's all it's going to give you. So if you, if you get a, ba a B courser straight out of the B course who understands the basic principles of basic fighter maneuvers, and you get somebody with a thousand hours of experience, that gap between the two and their skill level is not as wide. It still is, there's still a gap for sure, but it's not as wide it is, as it is with the Eagle, where it, if you t take that thing to its limit, uh, it takes a lot of time, a lot of practice, uh, and a lot of experience to be able to, to get, kind of get that aircraft to its to its limit. So, um, so it, yeah, so I don't know if that answers your question or not, but- um, Answers but, it perfectly. Okay, perfect, all right. So let's talk about your first uh, operational squadron and yeah, where were you based? Yeah, so after after Oregon, I went to uh, I went to Japan. So Okinawa, Japan, uh, is a small tropical island about 200 miles south of mainland Japan, um, and they have two Eagle units there. So they have the uh, the 44th Bats and the 67th Fighting Cocks. Uh, and so uh, when I showed up as a brand new lieutenant, I was uh, selected to to go to the uh, 67th uh, Fighting Cocks. So um, they uh, established uh, just after World War II, or kind of at the end of World War II, um, and uh, yeah, that was that was my first unit. It was uh, it was a pretty awesome experience uh, because, like I said, I I a Texas kid. I'd never really traveled, right? We didn't have money to like travel growing up or anything like that. So uh, we packed up, you know, the wife and the the dog and all the household goods, and we moved over to Japan and. We we're like buying cars and we don't know what's, you know, it, it was a really crazy adventure. It was a lot of fun. Um, but once I showed up, I hit the ground running uh, pretty fast because the squadron was getting spun up to go. Uh, they were they knew they were going to be going uh, to, to deploy in a few months. And so I didn't have a whole lot of time to enjoy it when I first showed up. Uh, so I showed up and when you show up, you have to go through what's called mission qualification training. So they know that you just came from the B course that you have the basic principles, but they still make you go through, you have to get through all of the, uh, uh, kind of one flight of each mission right. set, uh, right. to be able to prove that, you know, what's going on, um, prior to their signing you off to say, Hey, you're ready to go to combat. So I had to go through that real quick, but I wasn't done with it in time. 
because before they went down range, the squadron uh, flew the jets to from Japan to Florida in the United States to go shoot some missiles uh, to do some practice uh, prior to the deployment. Uh, so the squadron was uh, fortunate enough. They, they sent me on not being combat mission ready yet. They sent me to Florida to go on that uh, on that trip. Uh, and that was a wild trip because I was I think I was the only I was was the only lieutenant. Um, I still wasn't through training. I was like doing upgrade rides over the Gulf of Mexico. Um, admittedly not, I was exhausted cause I was trying to live the fighter pilot lifestyle with, you know, keep up with everybody, but also yeah. like get through everything. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, so it was, it was a, a great uh, trip before, uh, the deployment, uh, on that, on that deployment, I actually spent, or not deployment, that TDY, um, I, in one week, um, so on Friday, uh, I had my last flight, which qualified me to to be a a combat mission uh, combat pilot in the unit. So I got that on a Friday. That same night, uh, I we had a naming, and so they named me. They gave me my call sign Dozen. Um, the following Tuesday, I got to go fly uh, an F four. They had QF fours oh, out wow. there. So I yeah, so I got to go sit sit in the back seat of an F four. Um, and we got, and got to go fly. It was F4. I think it was the G model. Um, and we, so we did a two ship, did a little, uh, little BFM and, uh, some low level run around and stuff like that, which was great. Uh, and then the next day I got to shoot an AMRAM. The day after that, I got to shoot a AIM-9. So, and this was all within a week and I was a brand new lieutenant in the squadron. So I was like, I guess this is just what it's like to you be a fighter pilot. Like, like, I mean, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I was like, I guess this is normal, right? I knew no difference. So yeah, of uh, course. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but it was uh, that was a pretty that was a pretty great week. So, um, but from there we uh, we went back to uh, Okinawa, got spun up, uh, and then we went to the Middle East for eight months. Um, we spent eight months uh, down there in t- 2012, 2013. Uh, came back, and we got to, the opportunity to do a lot of uh, traveling across the Pacific as well when we came back. So uh, they went to we went to Thailand, um, up to Alaska for some red flag adventures. Um, Guam several times uh, for some large force exercise out there. Um, yeah, so that was kind of the the big recap of the first assignment. Yeah, not jealous at all. Not jealous at all, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> but then after that, you went on to be a T thirty eight instructor. Can you tell us briefly, like how this came about and why you went into that um, kind of uh, role? Yeah. So uh, honestly, it was very unexpected at the time. So kind of the natural progression is you do one assignment and then you follow on with another Eagle assignment uh, and then you go to like weapon school or, or things like that. Um, the way that uh, so uh, the way our, air, you know, it's broken down is they have what uh, vulnerability to move list. We call them VMLs. Uh, and in that assignment process, uh, they were thinking they were going to be shutting down RAF Lake and Heath. This is back in 2015, um, at, at wow. least the C model. The C model, the C models at Lake and Heath, um, they thought that they were going to be shutting them down, which there's the Reapers are still there. Um, but uh, so that happened. They also shut down the Eagle aggressors. So there used to be uh, aggressors in um, at Nellis. They were Eagles uh, and they shut that down. So they had a lot of places to send Eagle guys, but they had nowhere to send them. So what that means, what that meant was that there were there were just no Eagle uh, assignment opportunities available to me. So I had to find somewhere else to go. So they sent me to uh, back to where I actually learned to fly airplanes, uh, back to Shepard uh, in Wichita Falls, Texas. And uh, I went to go teach uh, what I talk, talked about, Introduction to Fighter Fundamentals uh, in the T-38. So, uh, so that's how that happened. Uh, that was interesting because uh, I was already familiar with the airplane. Um, it, the aircraft is, is similar in the Eagle in the fact that it is – not hard to fly the airplane, but to fly it perfectly, to, it can be a challenge, right? And so mm-hmm. uh, it was it was fun because it was constantly a challenge to fly better and better each time, um, you know, to the exact knot to uh, to get it to its ex- extreme limit as far as its uh, its uh, lift limit or, or whatever the case may be. Um, and there I had to learn how to drop bombs uh, because right I'm an air to air guy, uh, and we had to teach uh, basics of surface attack. So. Uh, everything in the T-38C is all digital, so we're not dropping act. We weren't dropping actual bombs, but uh, but as an air-to-air guy who had never dropped a bomb before, I had to go and teach all these new kids how to drop bombs and how to do these, you know, bombing patterns and all these things like that. So I had a little bit to learn, uh, but uh, but it was good. It was a great four years. Um, that IFF is is pretty interesting because it actually puts through half of all fighter pilots that the Air Force trains oh, in wow. that one. Uh, so it doesn't matter if you're going to the A-10, F-16. 
Eagle 35, 22, it doesn't matter what you're going to. Uh, and because it's NATO, I mean, we were training guys who were going to the Eurofighters. We were training guys who were going to, right, all these all these different aircraft uh, yeah. across the world. And so that one unit um, <clears throat> trains, like I said, half, half of all fighter pilots at the U.S. Air Force trains. Mm -hmm. So it was pretty cool because we had the opportunity to have, in that squadron specifically, you have the opportunity to have a big impact on kind of the foundational uh, culture of uh, of these these uh, future fighter pilots. And obviously you mentioned Lake and Heath there, but you were lucky enough to be posted to Lake and Heath back uh, flying the F-15C. Uh, can you tell us about this and you know how that assignment came about? So after, uh, after my assignment teaching introduction to fighter fundamentals, uh, it's time for me to go back to the Eagle, you know, Lake and Heath, uh, they see models at Lake and Heath had obviously not, they hadn't gotten rid of, uh, like the air force thought that they would. So, uh, so that's where they sent me uh, for my next assignment. Um, that was a very short lived. So I went back through the transition course. So after four years out of the Eagle, uh, I went back to Oregon. I got three rides to relearn how to fly the F-15. So it was just uh, a basic ride, an instrument check ride and like one BFM fight. Um, and then from there they shipped me off to Lake and Heath. So packed up the kids, uh, at that, this time we had two kids. So, uh, wife and two kids and went over to England. Um, and the squadron was downrange. So, uh, they were they were deployed, so it was me and about eight lieutenants that had also just recently shown up that hadn't hadn't gone down range with the squadron, um, and it I was there for about two months. Uh, I got you know a handful of rides in the uh, F-15 from kind of what was left over uh, to you know wait for the squadron to get back. And about two months in, I get a phone call and uh, I get told that I got picked up for the Thunderbirds. So. I tell my wife, like, all right, it's time to pack everything back up. And two months <laughs> two later, later like, oh, my had, God. Oh, here we go yeah. again. <laughs> two months later, we had packed up and we were we had moved to Las Vegas. But uh, but we loved our time there. It, I mean, it was four months uh, in, the, in the summer. It was a beautiful summer. Uh, it was 2019. Um, and, uh, yeah, it was 2019. Uh, it was a beautiful summer. And there wasn't a whole lot to do, so we just traveled a lot. We lived in Barry St. Edmonds, which is just a nice. magical little yeah. town. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so we, we really loved our very short holiday that we had <laughs> in Lake and Heath. I hope you went to the Eagle Pub. I did. I did. Yeah, yeah. I got I got a, a couple pictures with the, you know, the Robin Olds uh, signature on the wall. And uh, I had a, you know, my son was three or three years old at the time, so I was trying to explain to him the insignificance of it, but... Uh, no, it yeah. <laughs> he, just wanted, he just wanted a cork, didn't he? But, uh, yeah, I want to talk about... This is our favourite subject on the channel, especially for our viewers. Uh, DACT, how did the F-15 fare against, you know, the F-16, the F-18s, Typhoons, or what What did you fight against and how did the F-15 fare? Um, <clears throat> I think I had... In the F-15, I think I had the chance to fight against every Western aircraft because you know when we were in the middle east there was a lot of people out there uh with the iron falcon and the falcon nest um so i think i mean i i've gotten to go against the f-16 uh pretty much every model of the f-18 uh the raptor uh, i never went against the f-35 um in the t or in the uh, in the f-15 i actually went against the f-35 and the t-38 so i can tell that story if you want but yeah um, i'll have to have that one <laughs> the uh but uh the raptor you know we flew with them a lot strike eagles um the Gripen, uh, the Eurofighters, um, the Rafals. So yeah. So what uh, what question? You know, in in F sixteen so we we, we got to go. Yeah. So like how like, like yeah. How did you fare? So let's say against um, let's say the Gripen or uh, the Rafal. Like how did the F fifteen fare in you know that kind of dog fighting arena? Yeah. Okay. So I guess, yeah, talking more about the Delta wing aircraft. So like you get your Delta wing aircraft, like the Eurofighter or the Gripen or, or whatever the case may be, um, incredible aircrafts. And, and the fact is, is that like most fourth gen aircraft are very similarly matched. Um, right. And, and there are so many variables that go into it that, um, to compare apples to apples can be really, really tough because, uh, things like external drag are huge, right? So if I'm in an Eagle in a three bagged Eagle, meaning I have three fuel tanks on, uh, and I'm not dropping my tanks because I'm not right. Like I would in combat. 
-hmm. well, that's going to be a completely different profile uh, than it would be if I was completely clean. Uh, and vice versa for for other people, right? So, yeah. um, so it's easy sometimes, you know, if you know, if I was in a clean eagle and I went up against a a two bagged hornet, you know, I can be I can beat my chest and say like, oh man, that was so easy, I just absolutely crushed them. Uh, yeah. But in reality, there's there's pros and cons to each. Uh, for the for the big delta wing, uh, traditionally, what you find for the the delta wing aircraft, like the uh, like the Gripen or the the Eurofighter or whatever the case may be, uh, they are phenomenal. They get one they, their initial turn is really really good. Or even if even if it comes to like the Mirage, right, like the, the Mirage. 2000 like yeah. one really really good turn um and then after that it really depends on the specific airframe and their ability to control themselves at slow speeds uh as far as uh, as far as that goes so the uh eurofighter really really good really tough airplane to fight uh the gripen really really tough airplane to fight um you can hold your own but uh once again i think that the uh the quality of pilot or i guess the experience of the pilot uh in the eagle it would have a huge impact on that right course, yeah. so uh in order to do well against a eurofighter or, Gripen or, or something like that you have to have somebody who's fairly experienced in the eagle um because an inexperienced person uh, would just get crushed um the the uh let's see so honestly one of the most surprising aircraft uh or the, the people that i was the most surprised uh fighting against was actually the legacy hornets out of australia oh really so yeah so wow. we, we uh when we were when we were in guam we went against the magpies um and it was a great week uh so we had a there was a what's that exercise uh cope north uh, mm -hmm. out of uh out of guam and this was 2014 we uh so every, basically all the fighters flew out a week early. We all cleaned off our jets. So we took all of our fuel tanks off and we had a week of just dog fighting. So we, uh, so it was us, the magpies. So the legacy F 18s were out there. The, uh, the block fifties from Misawa had come down, uh, and, uh, F 16s. And so we would just go out and, and we had a full week of just oh learning, you know, practicing dog fighting with each other before the large force exercises started. And that was an awesome, awesome experience. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, it was interesting. Um, but I, but I, I was extremely impressed with the, the magpies and their, uh, the way that they could max perform that legacy F 18. So, um, Obviously, the F-18 is great because uh, it, it doesn't have incredible thrust to weight ratio like you see with, uh, you know, your F-16s or your your, uh, your F-15. But what it's very, very good at is once it gets slow, it can point its nose very well. Yeah. Um, and I, I remember being in a 6K defensive BFM fight and, you know, our – our game plan normally is to to break, so we'll we'll uh, you know get get to nine Gs or as close as we can, uh, and then just get ourselves as close as we can to uh, to the adversary. So he has to make a decision; either has to reposition or he overshoots or whatever the case may be. Uh, but I remember that uh, going against the Magpies, he uh, you know I broke and <clears throat> he was he, I think he was already a little bit slow, but he just pointed at me, and then as I continued to like break and like try to draw him in closer, he just continued to point at me and continued to point at me. <laughs> and I had no way of like getting away yeah. from him. So like this traditional game plan that I was used to from all the other types of aircraft uh, was kind of mocked next when it came to uh, to this aircraft that could just continuously point. Uh, but their their ability to assess uh, the basic BFM principles um, and just see closure and fight what they see uh, was really, really, really impressive. I was I was really impressed by those guys. Um, yeah. What about the RAF? Like, uh, are we good guys over? Like, are we good for BFM, ACM? Yeah. So, uh, so I, let's see, I did not get to, um, I turned a couple times in some large exercises with, uh, with the Eurofighters. Um, but I did not get to do any like true BFM, like perch nice. BFM type yeah. fight them. So, uh, a lot of stuff I did was at like 30 or 40,000 feet. Cause those are like the blocks that we were given uh, yeah. a couple times. I turned it at 20,000 feet, but I didn't get to do the whole like dancing spiral down to the dirt to see how, you know, kind of see how that works. Uh, I will say that in, now, BFM is, is something that is an important skill set to learn, but most of our uh, engagements happen beyond visual range. Um, and uh, all in all, most Western countries, right, most NATO countries, um, we all know what we're doing. We're all uh, on very much the same level. Yes, RAF pilots are, are awesome. Uh, they're, they're very, very good. Um, uh, you know, it's interesting cause, uh, getting to, you know, flying in Japan, you, you fly with a lot of Asian countries that, yeah. uh, you, you learn and you appreciate the Western 
style, right? The, the NATO style uh, of training, of learning. Uh, we don't want to get, any, get anybody in trouble, but, uh, or like <laughs> when you're in the Middle East, right? Like, uh, you know, I'd be flying against people flying the exact same aircraft um, or more capable aircraft in some cases. Um, and the pilot in the seat has a huge um, impact on how good that airplane can perform, right? So, um, you know, I think that's something that's often overlooked when people are like, oh, like the new flanker, yeah, this, that, and the other, right? It's like, okay, yeah, that's true. But, um, but uh, like, there may be a lot of capability in that airframe, but uh, it's only as good as what the pilot in the seat uh, can, can actually uh, execute uh, as far as how well that aircraft can actually perform. Trevor, so how many hours did you actually uh, uh, manage to get on the Eagle? <clears throat> Um, I have just over, uh, I think it's like 600 hours or something like that. Nice. So, uh, I mean, it's not not an incredible amount, but it's it's enough to get. Uh, I was very comfortable. <laughs>